Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar today. We're talking about how nonprofits can promote voting by mail. Uh, for everyone who's joining us today who maybe doesn't know who Nonprofit Vote is, um, found your way to this webinar some other way, we were founded in 2005. And our entire purpose is really to help nonprofits engage the people that they serve with voting and elections. We think the best way that you can accomplish this is really by integrating it into your services. So we have a vast online resource library with nonpartisan voter engagement resources. So today, uh, our agenda includes talking about the USPS and voting by mail. We'll take a deep dive into a couple tools for requesting mail ballot, and we have Civitech and Vote by Mail IO in the house. Uh, and then we'll talk about educating voters about the use of mail-in ballots. And all, as always, we'll do a Q&A session. Um, the chat box is a great place to let us know who you are, where you are, um, give us any sort of feedback or ideas. But if you have questions for our speakers, please use that Q&A button um, in the Zoom window. It should look like two little speech bubbles and say Q&A underneath it. Um, and our, our speakers will be answering some of those questions uh, via text, um, typing right into the Q&A box, so monitor that. Um, but we'll also do some Q&A live at the end as well. Um, so our speaker lineup today is fantastic. I'm really excited for everyone who's talking today. We're gonna start with Nonprofit Vote's very own James Hill to talk about how we're seeing the USPS and their role in voting by mail. Uh, then we have Sarah Jackal from Civitech and Brett Clark from votebymail.io. Uh, each of them will run through how their platforms really work and how you can take advantage of those. Uh, then we'll have Alex Psilakis. Uh, excuse me, Alex, if I mispronounced that. Um, Alex is with MassVote, who is a very close partner of Nonprofit Votes. And he'll be talking about the things that you really need to educate voters on, because for so many people, this will be a new process while about 25% of votes in the 2018 midterm came through voting by mail, a large percentage of those were represented by the states like Washington, Oregon, Colorado that have universal mail voting. So we know this is a really safe and effective way for voters to cast their ballots. Um, but I wanna invite James Hill uh, up to tell us um, more about why we think this is a really good way for people to vote and some things to keep in mind. Thanks, James. Yes, thanks for having me. Um, as if we don't already know each other and work together. <laughs> so yes, the USPS and voting by mail. Um, if you've been watching the news, if you've been listening to the communities you serve, you know that voting by mail, absentee ballot voting, all of these things have become a part of the conversation. And some people have some concerns. So we want to talk about that. So we've, just to let everybody know, you should let your communities know that we've held legitimate elections during the Civil War, World War II, and even the 1918 flu epidemic. And using the post office as a crucial part of that, was a crucial part of that electoral process the whole way. And that has not changed. The most important thing is to apply for and turn in mail ballots early, stress early. Um, next slide, please. So uh, if you can't get your ballot in the mail, uh, at least one week before election, there are some options. One, use a, use a secure drop-off box if available in your area. If there is no drop box in your area, voters can take their ballot to the post office for a postmark stamp before dropping it in the mail. Um, and if you wanna know more, we have state fact sheets on our site at nonprofitvote.org to understand the process in your individual states. Next. Uh, oh, I think that's it for me. Thanks, James. And I'm going to throw um, some of our 
new resources right into this chat box um, before we move on to our next um, speaker. So we have a blog, fact sheets, um, and even sample messages around um, that you can use for social media, newsletters, et cetera, so that we've taken a lot of that hard work out of it for you. Um, and so I'm really excited to have Sarah Jackal from Civitech as our next speaker to talk about this incredible tool to help people more easily request mail-in ballots uh, in the states where those requests are required and those ballots aren't automatically mailed to people. We've seen a lot of, of new uh, rules and changes uh, in light of COVID-19. Um, so everyone probably needs a little refresher. Um, and so we also have fact sheets on our site that I'll throw in the chat in a moment, but I wanna let Sarah take over and walk us through her tool. Hi, Sarah. Hi, thanks for having me. Um, I think I'm gonna share, yeah, I'll share my screen now. Um, bear with me for one second. So I'm Sarah Jackal. I'm the Chief Operating Officer of Civitech. At Civitech, we build technical solutions that power the next generation of nonprofits and organizations and causes um, to strategically target their voter engagement efforts. In particular, I'm here to talk today about our Campaign OS VBM tool, which is a unified 50 state vote by mail solution that makes an otherwise confusing and complex process convenient and accessible for voters. Our campaign OS vote by mail solution is largely built and modeled on the success of our voter registration tool. In 2018, we developed and launched the first digital voter registration tool that uses the power of mail to reach and maximize conversion among voter registration applicants. Uh, um, if you're not aware, over 30% of eligible voters nationwide still have to print and mail a paper application in order to register to vote either because their state doesn't have an online voter registration platform or because their state requires you to have a valid driver's license or state ID in order to access their, vote by, their voter registration platform. Um, yet every other national digital voter registration platform, if you're unable to register online, you're simply directed to download and print your own application and mail it in on your own. Uh, very few people have home printers. Fewer than 10% of people have home printers anymore. And as you've largely probably seen in the last couple of elections, a lot of people don't actually know how to access a stamp. They complete most of their transactions in life on the computer. So the conversion rate, not surprisingly, for people who have to download and print their own voter registration application is around 20% at best. We found that when we print and mail applicants, their own application pre-filled with the information they've supplied in our tool, along with a postage paid return envelope addressed to the proper election official. And we engage in targeted and strategic and thoughtful chase to those applicants. The conversion rate goes up from 20% to between 68 and 91%, um, which is really meaningful. So um, the same sort of issues that exist with, uh, with voter registration also exist with vote by mail. Um, many voters find the process for voting by mail confusing and daunting. They don't know if they qualify to vote by mail or how to sign up if they do so. Um, the state by state rules are complex and changing regularly. And as with voter registration, um, many states don't have an online vote by mail platform that enables voters to complete the process end to end electronically. And those that do mostly require individuals to have a valid driver's license or state ID. Um, for those of those who aren't able to access an online platform or email or fax in their form or don't have the proper ID necessary to do so, they still have to print and mail their form. And as is the case with voter registration, this disproportionately impacts the very same people who are already underrepresented in the electorate, young people, low income voters, people of color. So building on you know, the model we kind of established with voter registration over the last couple of years, we realized that the same gap really needs to be filled, needed to be filled in the context of vote by mail and even more so this year than ever before, given the need for vote by mail and the, you know, the distrust that's being sowed in the process and reliability of vote by mail itself um, by the current administration and others in the electoral space. 
So we built a 50 state solution that gives any voter nationwide the ability to vote by mail in whatever mean way is the most convenient way possible for them. So if they live, for example, in a state that offers an online vote by mail platform, we steer them in the direction in that direction and they have the proper ID to access it. Um, if they live in a state, many states um, that don't have an online vote by mail platform do enable voters to email in their application. So if they live in a state that allows you to email in your application, we steer them to do that. And finally, if they live in a state or aren't able to access one of those other two options, um, we help them complete their application and then we send them a pre-filled, send them their application pre-filled with their information along with uh, an envelope with prepaid postage and address to their local election official. Um, one of the things that makes vote by mail so much more complex than voter registration is that with vote by mail, your application has to be directed to your local election official as opposed to your secretary of state. And there are upwards of, you know, in many states, this is simply a county official. So you're talking, you know, 50 to 246 or whatever in Texas. In certain states, it goes to a municipal clerk like Wisconsin and Michigan, um, kind of key battleground states this year, um, where there are, you know, 1,875 and 1,300 municipal clerks respectively. And most voters do not know where they need to route their, their form to and it and actually serves as a pretty meaningful barrier for many voters. Um, so to going to walk you through the tool a little bit, the way the tool works. Um, it's first, once, an, once a user puts in their information, we first check to make sure that that individual, um, we take their, their name, address, date of birth, and before taking them through the process of applying to vote by mail, um, we collect their email and phone number, which is important to have down the road to engage in meaningful chase of these vote by mail applications, as well as the ballots once they've received them. And this enables the groups that use our tools to use that information to continue to engage with their voters. But before taking them through the voter, the vote by mail application process, we check to make sure they're registered so that they aren't applying to vote by mail in vain. And so that if they're not registered we, at the current address they're living at, we can let them know that and we can first make sure to get them registered. Um, if they are registered, we take them through the process of applying to vote by mail. And depending on which options are available in their state, we steer them, we take them through those different options. Here, the example shown is Florida. Florida enables voters to apply online at their county websites, to apply by email, or to print and mail their application and send it in. So we give voters all three of those options, but um, order them in, like, in the order that is the most convenient and most likely to uh, result in the, the process being complete the quickest first before coming to the last one, which print and mail obviously takes the longest. Uh, first, they, if they have an online platform, as is the case here, we take them to the online platform. If their state allows them to email in their application, we have them, we instruct them to take a piece of white paper and sign it with dark ink and take a picture of it with their telephone and to select the image take them through various steps to make sure that the image of their signature is properly cropped and has the right coloring and shading. And then we um, uh, accept their email address and allow them to email the completed form with their signature affixed to the form into their local election official. We use an actual signature as opposed to a trackpad signature because um, for voter protection purposes, many states do signature matching of mail-in ballots. And if you're the signature, the actual manual, manual physical signature that you put on your ballot doesn't match the signature that you put on your application, then you are subject to having your ballot thrown out and your vote not counted. So that is why we take people through the process of actually using their, their real signature as opposed to a mouse or uh, signing with your finger on your phone. If they aren't able to complete it by email, like I said, you can still complete the form at the, you know, with the address where they're registered or if they need to receive their, their ballot at a different address because they're temporarily residing away from home and voting absentee, they can complete it with a different address and then have their application printed and mailed to them. They also have the option to download their form and, print and send it in themselves. So that's how the process works. It really is designed to take the guesswork out of um, the process for voters. And I think what we've done is created a simple intuitive design that guides 
users through what would otherwise be a very complex process in the most simplified way based on in-depth state-by-state research. We also provide our tool. It is fully translated into Spanish and so it is available in Spanish and you can toggle back and forth between English and Spanish. And one of the unique things we do is that we, you know, in addition to providing data concerning the pathway that any individual user takes online versus email versus print and mail, we also provide end-to-end -end tracking of all mailed applications. Um, it gives more visibility into the USPS process itself so that we know we can alert voters if they need to engage and send in their applications or ballots earlier. We can see how long things are taking in the mail and we can also allow organizations to follow up with voters to let them know, hey, we know you've received your application based on the barcode tracking, but you haven't yet returned your application to the local election official. We want to advise you to do so and engage in other chase efforts like that. We also allow organizations to fully white label their tool, our tool, and provide backend analytics um, showing how many people have checked their registration status, requested a voter registration form, requested a vote by mail application, been redirected to a state online platform, et cetera. If you have any questions, um, please feel free to reach out to me or anybody on my team. This shows you some versions of uh, customized tools. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, I love this tool. I hope that people um, have found this over, overview useful, not just of the tool, but you're very thoughtful going over like the states and how so much has changed, and how there are so many barriers uh, in this work. Um, I want to remind everyone uh, to please use our Q&A box if you have any questions for the presenters. Uh, if you put a question in the chat, just throw it in that uh, Q&A box. Um, and I will now move on to our uh, next speaker. Um, so we have Brett Clark from votebymail.io. Uh, and Brett, thank you for being here and I will let you take it away. Caitlin, thank you so much for having me today. Nonprofit Vote is a fantastic organization. I will share my screen with you guys. So uh, the way that I'm gonna go about this is just show you guys how our tool works. Um, feel free after to ask any questions in the question and answer box and I will be happy to get to you. Um, so I'm gonna show you first how it looks from a voter's perspective and then how it's gonna look from an organizer's perspective. Um, so what a voter will do is they'll log onto our website and they'll type in their zip code. From there, we automatically will, then they'll type in their address. And what our tool does is it automatically finds their election official for them. And so what we'll do, so they'll type in their first, middle and last name. They'll type in where their address is, where they're registered to vote. They'll type in their birthday. And then our system automatically checks to see if they're registered to vote or not. So if they're not registered to vote, a little pop will say, hey, you're not registered to vote. And then in states that have online voter registration, we link them to their state specific pages and allow them to register to vote. From there, they'll type in their email address, they'll type in their phone number, if the ballot needs to be sent somewhere else as opposed to where they're registered to vote, they can input that information. And then they have the ability to upload their signature. So we have two ways to upload the signature. You can either upload a picture of your signature or you can utilize our trackpad where you can upload the picture of it. Um, so we have not had issues with the trackpad signature. Um, in the month of August, we've had over 5,000 signups and we haven't had any issues with the confirmation from the election official. Um, again, so you have two ways to upload the signature, either the picture or the trackpad. And then what you'll agree to do is agree to our terms and use in our privacy policy. Essentially, our terms of use is saying, hey, do not commit voter fraud. And then our privacy policy is stating, we don't sell data and we're asking that our third party partners do not sell data either. So this is what it looks like from a voter's perspective. This is what a voter would see. It's just the absentee ballot form. This form in particular was for Michigan. The voter would then click submit and success. So the voter would then re receive a confirmation email of their absentee ballot. And this at the same time was automatically sent to their election official. So there's no extra work on the part of the voter. That's all they have to do. On the back end, when we partner with our organizations, what they'll do is they'll sign in using a Google account. So they'll sign in using a Google account. And each organization receives their own dashboard. And so on their dashboard, so these are all the states that we have completely digital live uh, vote by mail sign up in. So in any of these states, if a voter signs up, this will automatically be sent to their election official. 
So what will happen is each, each organization will get their own landing page and they'll be able to claim as many landing pages as they want. And so what that means is I will name a page voter 101. And so what that means is once they claim that, it's going to be on the right hand side. And so this, that each, you know, we have the ability for um, our organizations to claim up to 25 landing pages as of now. Um, the reason for that is if you wanted to, you know, have multiple nonprofits under you creating landing pages like we have for nonprofit vote, or if you wanted to set it up by different regions within the state, or if you wanted to compare different vote by mail sign up methods, you can name each page something different. And so what will happen is once you've created your landing page, you just click on this little box with the arrow. And that's what actually gets sent out to your users. And so it's distinguished by that back end URL. So it's voter one on one. So any voter that signs up on this specific landing page, you receive access to their data in real time. And so you can track how successful your vote by mail sign up methods are. So any voter that signs up on voter one on one, your organization, sorry, just trying to see it, will have access to that data. And the way that you access that data is you click on this little cloud button and it will download as a CSV file. And so you never need to come back to us to ask for the data of the voters that you've signed up. Um, it'll just load as a CSV file. If you're inputting this into a van or a different database, it's easy to just push it into it. Um, but you have that data in real time. So you can track how successful your vote by mail signup methods are. On top of that, what we do is if you click on this little pencil and paper button, um, we have a couple of different things. So we have the ability to include your privacy policy as well as ours when you're signing up voters. The reason for this is that, you know, we want the voters to feel safe and secure. And so we want everyone's privacy policy there so that the, 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 voter, the, data, the voters can feel successful that their data is being safe. As well as that, if you plan on running any digital ads or Facebook ads to get vote by mail signups, you can put input that information in our, in our analytics section. And so that way you can track voter signups. And so with ours, you can tell how successful your signup methods have been, but also with that Facebook and those Google Analytics, if you're running digital ads, it just gives you the full picture. And then lastly, you have the ability to embed your page into, you have the ability to embed our page into yours. And so I'll just show you how quickly how that looks. So you can just iframe our page easily into yours. Um, I'm not so tech savvy myself, so I kind of like that, like a, like a little example. So one of our partners, um, the Civic Center, what they have is on their page, they have at the top, click here to register to vote. And so what happens is they click request vote by mail ballot. And then our page comes up right there. So super easy. It's very, very easy to get our page onto yours. So you can just have a tab that says sign up to vote, whatever it may be. And you can do that right there on your own page. So you, the voters will never even to leave your page. Um, yeah. But besides that, we want to partner with as many groups as possible. Um, we just, you know, thank you for your time. And that is... It. I will stop sharing my screen now. And thank you guys. Thanks, Brett. Um, I see that people are asking lots of questions in the Q&A box. You can continue to, to ask Brett and Sarah um, and Kelly from Civitech is also here uh, answering questions and responding to folks. So we want to make sure we get all of your questions answered. Um, so this has been, uh, you know, the tool part of our webinar. So how you can help people with requesting those ballots. Um, of course, there's the education part, as I mentioned earlier. So I'm really excited to have um, our next speaker uh, from MassVote uh, in Massachusetts. That just so happens to be where I'm located. Um, we've had a huge expansion of mail-in voting uh, previously. It was excuse only. I had never done it. I did my very first voting by mail process um, for the September 1st primary. Um, and so there's a uh, lots of uh, information that I learned by going th through the process that I think all of our nonprofits can really shed some light on. Uh, so Alex, thank you for being with us and uh, I'll let you take the floor and talk to us about educating voters. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I will uh, share my screen. Okay. All right. Um, Yep, so it's a, it's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, as Caitlin mentioned, my name is Alex Salakis. You got my last name right, which is very flattering because everybody gets it wrong. Um, so thank you. Um, and I'm here to just talk a little bit today about, you know, understanding vote by mail and helping those you interact with understand vote by mail because uh, 
even for people that work on voting rights, understanding all the changes that have been happening so quickly in the past four or five months, you know, make our heads spin. So just to tell you guys uh, a little bit about who we are, uh, MassVote is a, a nonpartisan, nonprofit uh, voting rights organization. Uh, we were origi originally founded as Boston Votes, and we worked specifically on the city of Boston, but uh, we've six, since expanded and uh, work in the entire state of Massachusetts. Uh, we work on issues like voting rights, uh, voter education, and social justice. And we do so to close the uh, economic, geographic, and racial voter turnout gap. Um, you know, specifically, um, there's a large voter turnout gap between white suburban areas and, you know, urban communities of color. Uh, so understanding vote by mail today, I'm just gonna tell you guys a little bit about educating in a couple of areas, um, you know, educating folks on applying to vote by mail, uh, knowing where they can go for info, uh, filling out and, and returning your ballot, and then finally, simply having a backup plan. Um, so when it comes to applying to vote by mail, things look very different than they did uh, back in February before the world went on fire. Um, only a couple states had what we like to call a full-on vote by mail system where everybody automatically received a ballot every election. Uh, those are states like Colorado and Washington and even Utah. Uh, amid COVID-19, some states like California have since moved to this system, um, but most states have moved to a kind of hybrid system where people can receive ballots in the mail, but they don't automatically receive ballots. Um, in some states, individuals automatically receive uh, vote by mail applications. Uh, others have to request those ballots um, manually. So that's, you know, that's a specific state by state issue. Um, you know, in terms of the process, again, it varies uh, very much state by state, but pretty much anybody can request a ballot to vote by mail at this point. Um, some states have what's you know called excuse absentee voting, where you have to have an excuse to vote absentee, like in Massachusetts. Um, most states have since waived that requirement for COVID-19, so virtually anybody is eligible. And uh, timing is really, really important. Um, pretty much we just tell people, no matter what state you're in, request that ballot as soon as you can, um, no matter what, because things have been hectic. You know, some of you might be coming in from Wisconsin or Georgia, which held really hectic primaries earlier this year. And uh, we want to make sure that no primaries look like that again. Um, there are usually deadlines for when uh, ballots have to be submitted. Uh, it could be they have to be submitted by election day or they have to be postmarked by election day. Uh, so understanding the nuances of each state is really, really important. Uh, so knowing where to go for info, uh, vote411.org is a superb resource that I regularly use. Um, it tells you about all the candidates running. It tells you about specific issues they stand for. And it breaks down, you know, all the races uh, within your specific, you know, voting district. Uh, I had to do some research when I was voting for county sheriff a couple weeks ago. You know, I didn't know anybody on the ballot. So, you know, there's a great resource right there uh, to help you with those sorts of things. Um, you know, you can also contact local election officials. Um, that varies between states for who exactly your official is. That might be a county clerk or a town or city clerk. Um, so it's always good to just double check uh, who that is for you, but they can pretty easily clear up what your deadlines are, um, how you have to fill out your ballot, things like that. Um, they do this stuff every day and, and they're inundated with everything that's going on right now. So they're a great resource uh, for you to reach out to. Um, and then finally, if you have any issues on election day proper, um, your best resource is 866-OUR-VOTE. That's a hotline, a sort of crisis hotline that runs all through election day um, to help clear up any issues that, that, ha that come up. Uh, you know, we had an election in Massachusetts just two days ago and people ran into all sorts of unexpected issues. Um, there's some stuff I'll touch on down the road, but a lot of people are concerned about, you know, oh, if I request a ballot in the mail, but I don't use it to vote, can I still vote in person? Short answer is yes. Um, but some local election officials might not know that and they'll say no. Uh, you know, if that happens, call 866-OUR-VOTE and they'll, uh, they'll help you right away. So these are just a couple of great resources that you can turn to um, in the weeks and months leading up to election day and then on election day proper. Um, so when it comes to filling out and returning your ballot, it's absolutely essential 
that you follow all instructions. Um, you know, I can give you a specific example for Massachusetts. You have to fill out your ballot and then put it in a specific envelope and then sign your envelope and then put that in another envelope and mail it because they need an additional signature to verify that you're voting by mail. If you don't include that envelope and sign it, then they're not gonna count your ballot and you'll either have to request a new one or turn out to vote on election day. And that could slow down your voting process for weeks, especially with the delays in the postal service. So it's really, really, really important that you just follow all the instructions. It seems sort of, you know, natural. Oh, of course I will, but you know, you could be busy. You could just, things could come up. It's just really important to, to follow all instructions. You know, um, simple things like circling in the, the, the dot, you know, things like that. Um, so that's really important to urge everyone to follow those instructions. Um, just to build off that, some states even include sort of letters in the ballots. Again, in Massachusetts, everybody who received an application in a ballot had specific instructions telling them to follow steps A, B, and C. So uh, follow those instructions if they're provided in your state. Um, when it comes to returning, this was uh, discussed a little bit earlier, um, but you can either put it right back in the mailbox. Um, some states have prepaid postage, so you don't have to worry about paying to return it. Um, some states require you to pay, um, that varies. Uh, you can also hand deliver it to your local election official. Um, you could take it to your town or city hall or, you know, depending on the state, that might be your, your county office. Um, and you can also drop it in the drop box. Um, some states like Colorado and Washington have drop boxes located everywhere. You know, it's so easy to find one. Other states that are pivoting to vote by mail in light of COVID-19 don't have as many. The city of Boston only has one or, or a handful. Um, so that's a problem. So, um, you know, those are being expanded and they're, they're very useful resources, um, but it's really important to be aware of where they are. Uh, that'll just make it easier to vote if, if you need to. Um, and finally, tracking your ballot. Uh, most states, uh, since transitioning to a sort of vote by mail system amid COVID-19, have implemented uh, a ballot tracking system. Uh, and it's really, really easy to use. You just typically type in your, your voter registration information and they are able to bring that up for you. Um, sometimes the language might be a bit unclear. You know, in Massachusetts, we have this issue where it just said processing for your ballot. And what does that mean? Like, does that mean they've sent your ballot, they're sending your ballot, they're gonna send your ballot? Nobody knows what that means. So um, in those sorts of cases, it's always best to follow up with your local election official and clarify things. But um, you can see that your ballot is submitted, um, you know, received, and then you can know, you can have that sort of peace of mind that uh, your vote has been counted. So there is transparency in this process um, that makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then finally, uh, having a backup plan. You know, there are multiple issues that can come up uh, when you're voting. Um, you know, for example, if you make a mistake or lose your ballot, that's not a problem. Uh, if you have enough time and you really want to vote by mail, you can just request another one. Or you can vote early or vote in person, depending on the regulations and hours in each state. Um, and if you never receive your ballot, that happens, unfortunately, a lot across the country right now, simply because local election officials are overwhelmed and they are, uh, they're dealing with unprecedented circumstances. So a lot of individuals who request ballots never receive them. Uh, if you never receive it, that's not a problem. Again, you can go vote early or vote in person. Um, you can also place a call to your local election official or shoot them an email. You know, I put in my application, this is anecdotal, but I put in my application, uh, I, went, I waited a week, I didn't hear anything. And then I just called them and I said, what's going on? And they said, oh, we'll look into it. The next day they mail my ballot. Um, maybe that's a coincidence, maybe not but it's always good to just double check. Um, and then finally, I didn't um, you know, include a slide on this, but just sort of talking about how it, have we as an organization have helped sort of spread these messages. Um, just pretend there's a slide on that here. Um, but as an organization, you know, like a lot of you here, uh, we have had to adapt to COVID-19. Um, we were doing a lot of grassroots on the ground work knocking on doors, you know, that's what election season is for, is going door to door, talking to people face to face. Um, and COVID-19 has made that virtually impossible. Um, so one thing we've been doing 
is uh, holding phone banks. We hold uh, two phone banks a week, uh, partnering with other organizations, recruiting volunteers uh, to call low voter turnout areas across Massachusetts, Boston, Worcester, Lowell, Springfield, cities like these uh, with large communities of color, low income immigrant, com uh, low income communities and immigrant communities. And, um, you know, we specifically call low voter turnout areas. And, you know, we try to just ask people, hey, have you received that vote by mail application? Yes or no? Okay. Um, do, you do you have a plan to vote? Things like that. Just trying to reignite that sort of uh, personal element of what's going on. It it it's far from perfect. You know, uh, phone banking isn't as effective as knocking on people's doors because, you know, somebody can just ignore the phone call or, or whatever. Um, but we're doing the best we can in these crazy times uh, we've got. Uh, you know, we've been partnering with other organizations to hold events. And um, to be honest, we've been getting a ton of earned media. We've been getting in like print, radio, television news, uh, because everybody's interested in elections right now. Everybody is interested, not just because of the presidential election, but just, you know, vote by mail as an issue is getting so much discussion. Um, so we've just been getting in the news so much, uh, talking about it, talking about its benefits. You know, in Massachusetts, for example, we just had an election, uh, and in this primary election, our, we had the highest voter turnout in a primary in 30 years. That's fantastic. And, and we believe that vote by mail played a significant role in that. Um, and we believe that other states are going to have high turnout because of vote by mail as well. Um, so really spreading that message any way and every way that, that we can. Um, and then, you know, we've been discussing with individuals, you know, when we have these phone banks, um, or when we're canvassing, you know, wherever, um, we've had questions come up, you know, how do I request this ballot? What if I don't get, um, you know, a ballot, things like that. Um, some of the, the really specific questions we've gotten um, are from people who have issues voting. Um, and unfortunately, these sort of arrive on election day. They come from that 866 Our Vote hotline that we discussed. One of the main issues that we see uh, in elections across the country, I sort of touched on it earlier, is when individuals request ballots to vote by mail and never receive them or do receive them, but they don't cast them. And then they go to vote in person. Sometimes local election officials tell voters, oh, if you requested a ballot, you can't vote in person. Oh, if you have a ballot that you requested and you're not submitting it, you still have to submit it. You can't vote in person. And that's not true at all. You know, in all 50 states, that is not true. As long as you have not officially voted, you can still vote. Um, and, you know, we don't believe that local election officials have any malice and are trying to suppress votes. We think that they're just a little overwhelmed and a little confused. Uh, everybody's dealing with something new right now. Um, so, it, you know, it, it's not their fault. Um, often the, the, the really persistent people, you know, demand that the warden come over and they go over things and eventually they can cast their ballot. Um, but for somebody who's got kids or a job they need to get back to or whatever, they might hear that and think, Oscar, oh, right, I'm not going to vote. It's not worth it. Um, and that's the last thing we want. So, um, you know, really understanding that as long as you do not officially vote by mail in any capacity, you can still vote in person. That's the number one issue that we've had. Um, another question that come, that's come up quite a bit right now is, you know, is the Postal Service reliable? Um, you know, we're not experts on the Postal Service. We can't tell you that. But what we can tell you is if you're not comfortable putting your ballot in the mail, take it to that Dropbox we mentioned. Uh, take it to City Hall or wherever you'd normally drop your stuff off in states um, because you can still deliver it that way and uh, you can avoid the lines on election day. Uh, one of the main benefits of vote by mail is that it limits congestion on election day. I brought up elections in states like Wisconsin and Georgia, which had immense lines on election day. Um, you know, in the state of Wisconsin back in April, you know, over 50 cases of COVID-19 were contracted uh, for voters because there was so much crowding on election day. Um, we want to limit that sort of crowding in every state because it'll suppress voting and it'll simply prove unhealthy for voters. It exposes them to the virus uh, when this can be avoided. So, um, you know, helping voters understand these key facts uh, is something that we've been pushing a lot. Uh, routinely questions are asked that uh, we don't know the answer to, and we have to do some research, again, because things are just so crazy right now. Um, but, you know, we're working hard, as all of you here are, 
to answer everybody's questions. And these are just um, some of the big ones we've had recently. Um, that about wraps up everything that I've got here. Um, happy to turn it back over to you guys. Thank you so much, Alex. That was great. Um, I'm sure everyone is excited to get the recording and slides for this webinar, uh, which we will send out next week. Um, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties, we weren't able to start our ASL interpretation. Um, we now have an ASL interpreter who will be doing interpretation for the rest of this webinar. We hope we can continue to offer this in the future. Um, for anyone who is not seeing uh, Patricia, our ASL interpreter, you can adjust um, your screen so that you have a different view. So click on gallery view in order to find the interpreter while the screen, um, if the screen's being shared um, and you can pin the interpreter's screen. Um, otherwise, uh, if you already can see her, that's great. Um, I do want to invite all our speakers to come on in uh, with, with cameras on so we can do uh, some Q&A session. We have so many good questions. Um, the first one I will direct uh, at you, James, because I know we've been having this conversation a lot. Um, what should we be doing in light of all the address changes that may be occurring, especially for college students whose campuses may be shutting down um, mid-semester? How, how should people handle those address changes? Well, <clears throat> I say specifically for students, um, well, I, yes, I would say make sure that your, your, your address should be, I guess, where you are most of the time. So I would say if it's at your if it's at your family home, um, I would say make sure that that's the address that you're you're putting down. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that would be the that's the first thought that pops to my head. Um, yeah, I yeah. can follow up with that a little bit too, Caitlin. Absolutely, Brett. Um, so we work a lot with the election officials, specifically in Michigan, and their advice to us is if someone had a mistake on their um, absentee ballot, if they mess up their address, it's just to reach out to them directly. Um, most have enough people on their staff where they're able to sift through those emails. But from what we've found in just our connection with the election officials is that the best thing to do is as soon as you know that your address is going to change, reach out to your election official directly and just make, make sure that they're aware of that before they actually send out your ballot. Thanks. Um, we do have some questions about accessibility of these tools. So we'll start with Sarah and then Brett, if you can weigh in. Um, so are these platforms accessible with screen readers? Um, and what about those who can't sign manually um, where a signature is needed? Yeah, it's my understanding our tool is, is accessible with screen readers. We've also done some, you know, we, we kind of revamped it last year as we were building it to make it more accessible and follow all the proper guidelines um, so that it would be accessible. Um, in terms of the people who can't sign their application, there are state by state rules that dictate what you need to do if you're not going to manually sign your application. So for those voters, I don't, the online, if they can apply online, they don't need to sign their application that they're, they're already capturing the signature from that they have on file in those cases. If they're gonna, they probably wouldn't be able to use the email workflow that we have in place, but if they printed and mailed an application, they're typically, you know, the state forms vary. There's a checkbox that you can mark if you're not able to physically sign and if you just have to put a mark or have in some states a um, kind of a third party witness or whatever sign or an agent sign on your behalf. So the, it is possible through our tool and I think it, it's all subject to the form itself and what your state provides. Yeah, and just to follow up on that, ours is also uh, screen reader accessible. And then, yeah, same with that. Um, as Sarah had mentioned, there is a part, portion of the absentee ballot where you can click, I cannot sign, and then have a witness sign it for you. Thank you. Um, and can you talk about um, the cost for platforms, um, paid versus unpaid features? Sure. So, Bert, I mean, I did mention in the chat, but just to be clear, so the Civitech 
um, vote by mail solution. It is a paid subscription and that's like how you get the back end data associated with it so that you can do all the necessary follow up chase. It's customizable and white labelable for organizations that want to have their own tool. For that, it is $4,500 subscription sign up everything through the end of the year, plus the print and mail costs associated with your users, which vary based on volume, but are between $1.30 and $1.80 per form. Um, for organizations that are smaller and have, you know, a smaller group of users who don't necessarily want to have all the data on the back end, they, we do have a free version of our tool at registertovote.org that you're free to direct users to. Anybody can use it free of charge and we do our own fundraising to back up the print and mail costs and support um, users who can't necessarily, you know, don't have access to or groups who don't have the funding to create their own version of a tool. So votebymail.io is a completely free service. Um, we are a C3 nonprofit. Um, so like our mission here is just get as many people to vote as possible. Um, so with our tool, it's completely free. We want as many nonprofits utilizing it. And so you have access to the data in real time with our tool. So feel free to use it. We'd love to have as many people working and getting as many people to vote as possible. But we are free, yes. Thanks. Uh, Alex, um, I'm seeing a question in here. I'm wondering if um, you've encountered this. How are you explaining, folks, uh, the difference between a mail-in ballot versus an absentee ballot? Are you seeing confusion around that, and how are you addressing it? Yeah, so that's a really tricky issue. Um, so just to help you guys understand, basically, right now, most states are using vote by mail, and they call that early voting by mail, um, because within each state, I mentioned earlier, some states require you to have an excuse to vote absentee. Um, and, you know, in Massachusetts, for example, that excuse is you either have to be out of town on election day, you have to have uh, a religious a belief that gets in the way of voting or a physical disability. And if you don't meet one of those three categories, uh, you can't vote by mail. Um, so what the state here in Massachusetts do has done has implement what they call early voting by mail. So they literally implement a period of early voting for each election and then allow you to vote by mail while voting early. It's a really nuanced, frankly, dumb way to do things. Um, but to change uh, in Massachusetts, you know, the absentee voting requirements, it takes a constitutional amendment and that takes uh, four years to do. So they're using this sort of early voting by mail as a temporary uh, short term solution. Um, so we're kind of staying away from using the term absentee voting um, because the state and most states are kind of getting away from that unless they don't require an excuse. And if they don't, that's fine. Um, and here's where talking about voting rights gets tricky because all 50 states have 50 different systems. Um, but if you have any questions, you know, again, it's always good to just reach out to your local election official. And if you have any questions about voting by mail, just tell them you want to vote by mail. And, and they'll help you out. They're not gonna. They're not gonna go through any convoluted steps like I just discussed. They're gonna get you what you need, and and they're gonna help you vote. So navigating that that absentee versus vote by mail issue is kind of thorny right now. Um, but vote by mail is is the term that most people are using right now, just because it, it's what fits for now. I can jump in here too. I, I think for the purpose of voters, to simplify it. There is no difference between an absentee ballot or a vote by mail ballot. It is a mail in ballot. They are the exact same thing. There's only actually about 14 or 15 st states now that have any sort of distinction between voting absentee or voting by mail, but they are, for all intents and purposes, from a voter's perspective, the same thing. And the only difference would be the type of application or the whether or not you have to check a certain type of box. But I think in this climate where we're really trying to simplify the process and eliminate confusion, if that question were posed to me, what's the difference between an absentee ballot and a mail-in ballot? There is none. They're actually mailed the exact same thing. Thank you. Um, so I am seeing some questions about um, for folks who are waiting until sort of late in the cycle um, to engage and if any of our panelists have uh, suggestions or advice for people who are, you know, maybe waiting until the second half of October uh, to get started on the mail voting process. 
Well, a lot of the deadlines aren't until you know late in October to apply to vote by mail. The problem is, is if you want to do that and receive your ballot in the mail and have time to then mail it in, you may not have sufficient time. So, I mean, one, there are other resources, people who wait and to engage until that period can vote early, whether or not that's voting in person early or the so-called picking up a mail-in ballot and completing it in person or coming and dropping it off a little while later. Um, but there also is sufficient time to vote by mail if, at the end of October, particularly if you're willing to go pick up your ballot in person and then mail it in or return it in person. I wouldn't say that most of the time, people who apply to vote by mail and vote by mail, that happens in October. States don't start sending out ballots until most of them 30 to 45 days before an election. So um, I would hesitate to tell people that they're going to be too late and that they therefore will have to vote in person on election day. Because I think even if they're doing it at the end of October, it's still flattening the curve of voting and making sure that with a, with a limited amount of polling places, they aren't A, exposed to COVID unnecessarily, or B, exposed to a really long line that they're going to end up getting tired of waiting in and not ultimately vote. And just to expand on that a little bit, um, just we've kind of worked about just making it known and we're running a campaign come October, just letting people know like, hey, you can fill out your ballot and you can just hand it in. And so if you don't feel safe on, on voting day, you can drop it off voting day, you can drop it off beforehand and just making people aware that, hey, there's other ways to drop it off as opposed to putting it back in the mail. So you can always request it a little bit later, but at that point, you could also just make sure that you're dropping it off as opposed to putting it back into the mail. Uh, I'll also make a plug here for the role that nonprofits should be playing, uh, educating and encouraging people to uh, engage early. So if there's anyone on this webinar that has not already signed up as a partner for National Voter Registration Day, which will be September 22nd this year, please get over there, sign up. Everyone who wants to vote by mail has to be registered. So you can start by getting folks registered. Then uh, the first, uh, I think it's October, the week of October 4th is uh, National Voter Education Week. So that's a whole week of activities around educating people to get vote ready. And then October 24th is Vote Early Day. So that's I think a good day not to request your ballot, but maybe throw it in the mail or the Dropbox. Um, but you can really take most of September and October to be educating, engaging, and really encouraging people to uh, get involved as early as possible. Um, we do have a few more questions before uh, we wrap up. So let's see. Um, somebody asked if there are any concerns about needing to add extra postage. We know not all states provide stamps. Um, so maybe uh, Sarah or Brett, what would you say to folks who uh, in states where postage is required about how many stamps they might need? Again, it totally depends. I mean, in California, this postage is supplied, but the ballot is huge because we have all the, you know, a referendum. Um, I think probably three stamps will be sufficient anywhere. Probably most places two stamps would be fine. I also, I don't want people to hang their hat on this because everything is a little bit, you know, difficult with the USPS right now. But as standard practice for decades, the United States Postal Service will deliver all election related mail, including mail in ballots, whether or not there is postage on it. They're not going to not deliver your ballot because there's no postage. They are like people who operate with integrity. That has been standard practice in the office for a long time. So if you're missing four cents and I, they're not weighing all the ballots, right? Like if you're missing four cents of postage, it's going to get there. That's not the thing we should be focusing our concern on right now is, is my advice. And I think the nonprofits who live in, who are in states where postage is required, I would see if you can get your hands on a ballot from the lo a local election official or have them weigh it so that then you can provide advice statewide that is a ballot takes two stamps or whatever. And that can be a part of your educational mission or whatever right now. Thanks. Um, we also got a question about whether nonprofits can provide stamps um, to voters. Um, and this is a great question because uh, if you don't know, nonprofits and anyone is not allowed are not allowed to give away things of value to impel or really encourage people to vote. 
um, that is written into the law. Uh, and so this year with the expansion of vote by mail, we've seen a lot of questions about whether we can give people stamps. We checked with legal counsel and uh, what we're hearing is that it's totally fine to give stamps, even if you affixed that stamp to a pre-addressed envelope, um, you know, in the case of applying for a mail ballot, um, it is not considered um, a bribe or anything like that because the voter could, first of all, not use the stamp um, or they could use it for something else. Uh, and it's relative, partially because it is relatively low value. Um, our legal counsel is telling us that it's totally fine. So if you live in a postage required state, um, I, you know, it may be a little costly to send uh, stamps to everyone, um, but if, if there is a need for stamps, you can feel confident in your legal right to provide those to voters. Um, we will do, uh, there's lots of great questions in here. Um, we will, I see a lot about uh, misinformation and we are trying to put together a webinar specifically about how nonprofits can tackle misinformation uh, because that's such a big topic this year. Um, but I think uh, I, I really want to just, before we wrap up, give all our presenters just an opportunity to give some final uh, words things to remember, if you take one thing away from this webinar, uh, what would you want people to take away? Uh, and we'll go in order. So James, we'll start with you. Sorry, I was on mute. Um, I think, well, one of the things to take away is um, we have done a lot of work to do, uh, to put up a lot of resources uh, to help organizations and people to find out the best way to vote by mail um, in this confusing time. So if you go to nonprofitvote.org on the right side of the homepage, we have a list of assets. Um, so if you ever have any questions, uh, nagging doubts, anything like that, we've, we have you covered uh, resource-wise. So please check that out. And I would just say, I mean, you, you all are gonna play a really important role as nonprofits in states this year because voting is habitual, both whether or not you vote and how you vote. And to Caitlin's point at the outset, Many people have never voted by mail before and they're accustomed to voting in person and this is a big shift for them. So giving them the information, the education and the resources and making this less confusing and simplifying the process, which I think you all are the most enabled to do because you can really focus on just your state and your specific rules and boiling that down for them um, is gonna be essential this year. So um, I hope our tool can help play a part in that, but I also hope that, you know, you're able to build the resources to make sure that this process is accessible for everybody. Yeah, just to, to piggyback off that, um, you know, voting at home and vote by mail is a time and tested process and we should feel secure in that process. And I think that as nonprofits, you guys have done the work of creating those true understanding and connections with your constituents. And so I think that you are the people that they most trust in the community. So as long as you're getting the word out and making sure that they are aware and informed and normalizing the process of voting by mail, I think that's a super key important part in this. And, you know, we'd, if you have any other questions, feel free to reach out later. We'd love to connect. And uh, all I'll say is uh, when it comes to educating voters across your state, I would tell them do everything as early as they can. Uh, request that ballot as early as you can. Uh, put that ballot in the mail as early as you can. Um, because if you don't, a sort of trickle down effect happens where more people request, enough ballots aren't sent out, there might be longer lines on election day, and that can lead to a lot, whole host of problems. So if people want to vote safely and securely, just do everything as quickly as you can. Thank you. Thank you, James, Sarah, Brett, Alex. Thank you, Patricia, for providing ASL interpretation for our Q&A. Uh, I hope everyone has a fantastic rest of your week and keep an eye out next week for the recording slides and relevant links and information in our follow-up email. Uh, until our next webinar, thanks and goodbye.